Well, uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be uh, with such a great audience. Uh, I do like to start off uh, getting a little bit of a gauge of the neuroscience knowledge. So uh, how many of you here can read this like a book where you, you, know, you look at this and this, this just all makes complete sense to you? You get you know, all, the, all the pixels in here. Uh, just, just go ahead, raise your hand. Don't be, don't be shy. How many of you can read this? Okay, great. Well, my promise to you is uh, by the end of this talk, you will be able to read this. Um, so if you get nothing else out of this, uh, you'll, you'll have enlightenment for this image at least. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk today about is a brain preservation uh, technology uh, that I developed uh, two years ago called Aldehyde Stabilized Cryopreservation. Uh, and this is the world's first nanoscale whole brain uh, preservation technique. Uh, what that means is it's able to preserve the synapses of a brain uh, such that they look like the highest grade connectomics quality uh, brains that are generally studied in neuroscience. Uh, a little bit of background uh, for myself. Uh, I studied at MIT, uh, studied under uh, Minsky and uh, Sussman and Winston. Uh, studied neuroscience as well. Uh, I left for uh, MIT for a year and worked on this uh, thesis for AI uh, where you had little robot bodies that could move around in a simulated world and they had skin and they had you know tendon joints and they could you know feel themselves when they moved around. Um, they'd look at each other and try to recognize them doing different actions and uh, it worked okay. Uh, but while I was doing the master's thesis I saw this uh, science prize called the Brain Preservation Prize. And this was put out by the Brain Preservation Foundation. Uh, and it was to be awarded to the first team that could preserve the connectome of an entire mammalian brain. Connectome meaning all of the individual synapses in the brain that store memories. So your brains, each of them right now, has about 86 billion neurons in them and something like maybe a quadrillion or so synapses. Um, and so you know, this kind of scales down depending on the size of the brain, but the goal is to preserve all of them. Uh, and I thought that was a really cool scientific goal. And so I started volunteering for the Brain Preservation Prize. Uh, there were two competitors at the time. And uh, in the process of trying to explain what they were doing, I thought, well, I think I can just win this prize. And so I uh, left MIT and, and worked for about nine months to make uh, what I thought would work a reality. Uh, we won the prize. And now I've started a company called Nectome, uh, which is kind of devoted to extending this technique, scaling it up, um, pushing the limits of it uh, with an ultimate goal of being able to preserve memories uh, that are stored in the brain, um, in addition to the structure which we already have. So to very briefly explain this, uh, what aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation does is it's combining two different chemicals uh, to preserve the brain. The first of which is a chemical called glutaraldehyde, um, this one here. Uh, and it's delivered to the brain and it, it, it does a process called fixation, which is essentially gluing biomolecules together very quickly um, and stabilizing the structures of the brain. And then the innovation is the second part, which is adding cryoprotectants uh, to the brain slowly over time. Uh, this is the same type of stuff you might use uh, as an antifreeze for your car. Um, and it prevents ice formation. Uh, the key here is this gives you super short-term stability. Um, if you just fix a brain, it will last for several years um, without much degradation, but it's still an aqueous environment. There's still water that is causing molecules to move around. Uh, and so you need to further immobilize the structures with vitrification, which is uh, a process of kind of freezing a brain, but without any ice. Uh, so if you can imagine some honey that you would put in a freezer, uh, it'll just become more and more viscous over time, more and more solid until uh, it doesn't flow anymore. It's kind of a glass. And so the combination of these two techniques is aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation. And they're based off of the two competitors. One of the competitors was doing fixation and then trying to do a bunch of other steps to it. Uh, one of them didn't have the fixation and had the vitrification. Put them together, you get ASC. Uh, <clears throat> And what's the point of all this? Like, where, where is this kind of headed, all right? Uh, the goal here is 
uh, maybe good to, how many of you have a computer science background? All right, got a lot of computer science. Okay, have you ever heard of the Visual 6502 project by any chance? Anybody heard of that? It's a really cool, neat little project. Ah, you've heard about it, all right. Um, it's a really fun little project. Um, some guys took uh, what's considered the first uh, computer chip, 6502, and they just took microscope images of the individual transistors that are on this chip. So, you know, here's this dead chip. It's actually got kind of some of the connections burned out on it. Um, but the overall circuitry is still good. And you can, if you're careful, kind of map out what, where the transistors are, what's connected to what, and you can then create a logical description of that circuit. And then they can simulate this in a computer and it'll do 6502 things. Um, you hook it up to appropriate memory, you hook it up to appropriate program. You can play a game that was programmed for the 6502 on your simulated version of a 6502. And what we want to do is the same thing for a brain, but that is a much larger scale challenge, but it's not really a difference in kind, it's a difference in scale. So same deal, you preserve a brain, you convert it into a form that could be imaged, you take a tremendous amount of images, um, that's the equivalent level of detail to a transistor level description of the circuitry, and then you simulate it. This is the level of detail that's thought to be approaching what you need to actually reconstruct a circuit in a brain. Um, and so this is sort of equivalent to that transistor image that you saw before. Uh, and I imagine this makes zero sense to pretty much any of you, right? So uh, we're gonna have a short course in how to interpret electron microacid brain tissue. Are there any questions at this point, by the way? <laughs> any questions so far? Nothing? <laughs> Anyways, um, <clears throat> all right, so you start with this. Um, one of the more salient features in this image uh, is the mitochondria, which here, yeah, what's up? Yeah, you um, actually have some brain in my wallet right now. <laughs> so you, um, if you're going to prepare a brain for electron microscopy, you, this is some rabbit brain, um, so from the, from the one that you saw earlier. Um, I think it's actually from this brain, actually. Um, <clears throat> so you prepare the brain, uh, you dehydrate, you expose it to uh, heavy metal stains so that it can be visible for the electron beam. And then you encase it in this kind of plastic resin. And uh, if you take a look at this, you see that those individual slices are about as thin as a, as a piece of paper. And if you imagine cutting into that piece of paper edge on 10,000 times, those are the size of the little pieces that you then put into an electron microscope. So you would have to take thousands of slices. The Oh, hmm. that's not good. Um, that's right. And so, you know, this, what do we got? What do we got going here? We got some feedback. Anybody? What's, on, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? Just stay away from that speaker. That's the speaker? That's the problem? All right, cool. We'll go over here. All right, cool. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the image, the video that you saw earlier, um, there's sort of two ways to, to cut through these layers of brain tissue. One is you can use a diamond knife that's sharpened to a molecule thin blade and you can cut about 35 nanometers. Uh, for comparison, the individual pixels here are something like, you know, maybe two to 10 nanometers. Um, <clears throat> and a more recent technology that's even better than the, the diamond blade is an ion beam. You can use an ion beam to shave off just two nanometers of, of the surface of this and then take another image. And so you can actually get isovolumetric pixels, which is how that original uh, video that was playing was shown. Um, but you can get a lot of detail. Another way is just to get a very thin slice and just shoot the electrons through it or on it and have them bounce. And then you can get pictures uh, with the side effect of them being a little bit blurrier, but not, not too much. Um, and this image was taken that way, just a very, very thin slice, um, about 900 atoms thick, this, this slice. Uh, and you can still move them around when they're 900 atoms thick. Um, and then the electrons were sent through it. So these are mitochondria, uh, highlighted in red, and they're these long, almost bacteria-looking things. 
And you can identify them because they have these folds in them. Um, and in generally, they are a little bit denser. So you know, this is a mitochondria, that's a mitochondria, that's a mitochondria. And these are uh, providing power for the brain to function. Um, you almost always find them you know, near where protein synthesis is happening or near where um, a synapse is. And then another really salient feature is this big dark circle around this one uh, process. And that is called myelin. Uh, so that's a, a way to kind of strength, uh, make the signals go a little bit faster. Um, you can almost think of it as like highlighting that one connection. It's a little bit more important. Um, and then probably one of the most important features, but one that is a little bit less obvious um, when you initially look at it, is our, our synapses. So these are synapses. Uh, we've highlighted them in blue and yellow. So each of these is a connection between one neuron and another neuron. Um, and this is probably best understood in 3D. Um, so you can see how these neurons connect to each other. Uh, the brain is kind of like a plate of spaghetti. It's densely packed with all kinds of processes going everywhere. And I find that this really helps to uh, convey the idea here. So, what you're seeing is this guy is holding this um, silicon wafer, and on the silicon wafer, there's these very tiny little pieces, and each of these little pieces is about 900, uh, 500 to 900 atoms thick, okay? And then we can zoom into this even more, and uh, this is gonna do a 3D reconstruction of an extremely tiny, tiny region of, uh, of the brain. So right here, these are neurons, individual neurons, and they're kind of arranged in a line, and they send out their projections, and those kind of talk to each other. They make synapses. You, do you see any mitochondria in this image? Uh, come point to one. The, uh, the, Don't be sure you come up and point to one. The, the sausage looking one towards the this one? Yes. All right, good. You're already learning. So this one was cut by the diamond knife. Um, and you can get a 3D cube of this. And so all these 2D images, you know, they've got a 3D existence. And it's, it's kind of like spaghetti. So you can trace out one single process, and you can see how each layer is making a hole. And so the green one is from one neuron, the red one's from another neuron, and that right there is a synapse. And so are these. All of these are connecting to other neurons. A single neuron can have 10,000 synapses. So it's you know, one big core, sends out processes that branch over and over and over again. They have synapses with all kinds of stuff. A very complicated device. So these are the synapses. So each of these synapses is part of this huge neuron that's this huge structure, right? And each one of these points is where one neuron is talking to another neuron, right? And highlighted in yellow here are things called vesicles, right? So a synapse kind of has more or less sort of three components that are really obvious at this uh, level of resolution. It's got generally mitochondria hanging around to give it power. It's got a bunch of vesicles, and it's got what's called the synaptic cleft. And when that neuron wants to send information to the neuron it's connected to, one of these vesicles fuses with this uh, barrier, and it releases neurotransmitters. So these little um, bags are full of, of neurotransmitter. Um, like this is sort of like the fundamental level of computation. And one bag will go and release, and then that's going to uh, those neurotransmitters are going to bind to receptors on the other side of this uh, synapse and then that will influence the behavior of the neuron that they've kind of connected with. Um, so <clears throat> if we zoom into a synapse a little bit more, you can see these structures a little better. Here's a mitochondria, there's mitochondria. These are the vesicles. That is the synaptic cleft. Vesicles, synaptic cleft. Okay? So now, some of this might make a little bit more sense, all right? 
here's some mitochondria, right? And can anybody find a synapse in this image? Who's brave? Who wants to point one out? You do want to come? Point to one. I guess it is like a dark place or, or, or someplace dense because they have to... Because you're looking for vesicles and you're yeah. looking for oh, a kind of a point of connection. This is a little bit zoomed out compared to the other image. Okay. Uh, so like maybe here where there are there vesicles on the edge? Maybe that that one looks like they're just next to each other. Oh, so okay. maybe maybe like this one, right? You see these little dots? Oh, oh yeah. So there's a synapse right there. Right. Good one. All right. There's a synapse. There's a synapse. All right. You've got um, there's probably maybe a hundred or so synapses in this image. And then if this was going to continue going forward, you can see how it's a very complicated three-dimensional structure. So brains are really complicated, all right? Yes. Um, so right now it's playing through. Is that you go in through the different layers, or is it like moving around? Right now? This is like a 3D cross section of oh. that static structure. It's the exact same thing as that cube that you saw before. Um, it's a little bit better. This is uh, using the FibSim technology, the newer one. The older one was with the diamond knife. Um, and, but it's the same deal. So, so it's almost like you're, you're looking through an x-ray of something. Um, it's a static physical structure and you're moving through it. And, and in fact, it's actually you know, that plastic that I showed you before. And every time you see an image, it's because we used an ion beam to blow away the last image and destroy it and then image the next layer underneath. All right, so that's synapses. So you know, when you look at it, it's, it's not very colorful. When I look at it, I kind of see this sort of stuff, all right? Um, and then another really interesting thing are these things highlighted in green, and that is the cytoskeleton. So it's the individual little filaments that exist in the neurons that help to give them their shape and also help to transport machinery and other stuff uh, to the synapses. If a synapse wants to become bigger, um, you'll see all types of machinery and other ingredients being transported down these kind of roads uh, to where the synapse is to remodel it to make it larger. So hopefully this gives you guys something um, in terms of being able to interpret electron graphs or, or any questions at this point? What do you think? Does, it make, does the video make a little bit more sense? Yes. All right, good. Um, and you can see the immense complexity because uh, that is such a tiny, that whole video is such a tiny region, you probably couldn't even see it, right? Um, and yet it's got hundreds and hundreds of synapses and that's just in one single frame of it and it's a three-dimensional structure. And that's what's going on in all of your heads right now. And it's, except it's alive. Things are moving around. Like things are being transported down these, these roads. And there's like a quadrillion of these synapses. And the words that I'm telling you right now are being transformed into alterations to those synapses as you're forming memories. It's pretty wild. So going back to our analogy, uh, the idea is we want to interrogate the brain at the lowest level uh, to understand how it's doing computations, and if we want to do that, uh, you know, eventually we're going to be able to get to a kind of abstract description of a complicated neural network like the brain, and potentially be able to emulate it. But if you want to actually do that, you've got to preserve the brain well first, right? So now we can get back to the way that this ASC procedure actually uh, works in practice, like how do we actually do this. Um, and one of the main concepts is this idea of perfusion, right? So this is delivering chemicals through the circulatory system of the animal. And the reason we want to deliver them to the circulatory system is because it's already designed to get chemicals everywhere, to every single cell, uh, very quickly. Uh, every single neuron in your brain needs a constant supply of oxygen and sugar, or it dies. And so your blood vessels are designed to be delivering that constantly, um, and very quickly. And every single neuron in your brain is no more than a tiny distance away from some capillary that's going to be feeding it. So what you can do is you can install uh, cannula into those uh, main blood vessels that supply the brain and then instead of blood you can send whatever chemicals you want and they will get everywhere almost immediately. And so <clears throat> this is kind of the first step of this procedure is you know, in a rabbit model, uh, you would go to the carotid arteries that are powering the brain uh, and the rest of the face, and then you can wash the blood out with a washout solution, which is designed to approximate blood, except it doesn't have any red blood cells in it. 
So you can wash all the red blood cells out of this brain uh, and you can control the temperature, you can control the pressure. Uh, this pump is approximating a heart for, for that animal. It's no longer connected to the heart, so you need something to push the fluid through. And this is what it looks like in the abstract. This is what it looks like um, in the, the real world. All right, so this is that pump. This is that filter, right? And the heat exchanger is down here. Uh, it's got a little power supply to keep it going. And this is what we used to actually uh, do the first stage of this procedure. And then the second stage of the procedure is the actual ASC part, right? So once this animal's gotten the blood removed, you transition to fixative, right? So this is a solution of glutaraldehyde. Uh, you pump it through the same way you did the washout solution. And almost immediately uh, upon contact, it is gluing biomolecules together. Uh, glutaraldehyde looks like a pair of handcuffs. I at least kind of think it looks like a pair of handcuffs. And it sort of works like handcuffs too. It grabs onto proteins, it grabs onto itself, uh, it grabs onto all kinds of stuff. And it converts the brain from something that's very dynamic um, with, I mean, things move in the brain, right? Like the nuclei of, of, your, of your neurons actually rotate around all the time. And mitochondria can, can migrate from one region to another. And a whole, like a mitochondria can be attached to a, a cytoskeleton and actually get like carried somewhere. Um, and the glutaraldehyde goes in and, and glues everything at a very tiny level and stops all of that motion almost immediately. Uh, so once you've fixed this brain, it's, uh, it's much more robust. The consistency of the brain goes from almost like soft porridge, um, as it is in life, to a kind of soft rubber. And at that point, you can recirculate fixative. So the same way that blood's constantly recirculated in your body, you can have this fluid leave out of a vein and then recirculate it. And so now you've got kind of a stable system. And believe it or not, you can run a system like this for days with no problem. Um, I mean, circulatory system works for years with no problem, so a few days is no big deal. Uh, but what we do is we slowly and very carefully add the ethylene glycol to uh, the brain. And <clears throat> previous attempts to cryopreserve brains run into this problem where if the brain hasn't been fixed before, um, the cryoprotectant will cause a lot of structural damage because um, it's very toxic and it'll cause the brain to start to degrade uh, very severely. So uh, you always have to race. You know, you can put the cryoprotectant in very quickly, but if you add it too quickly, then it'll dehydrate the brain very severely and kind of crush everything. And there's no good way to win. Um, if, you, if you put cryoprotectant in very rapidly, you crush the brain. If you put it in very slowly, you, you dissolve the brain. And you can lower the temperature and it'll slow the rate at which it causes damage, but it also slows the rate at which it gets into the brain to begin with. Um, but since we fixed the brain beforehand, we can very slowly add cryoprotectant and you relax the time limits uh, completely. So it can be done at room temperature, um, it can be done over four hours, and there's no distortions of the brain that occur as you add the cryoprotectant in. And you add quite a bit in. You go from 0% cryoprotectant to 65% ethylene glycol and 35% water. So it's more ethylene glycol than it is water um, after you're done with this. And once you, this is the, what this looks like in real life. So this is like a recirculating gradient former. These are the pumps that, that handle um, the main pump, uh, which is acting as a heart, and two that are dealing with creating the gradient. And uh, this, is, this is where we did all the work. Um, and so are there any questions about that? How do you kind of physically do this? It's perfusion, it's fixation, and then it is slow addition of cryoprotectant in over like four hours. Mm -hmm. This is like pretty nitty gritty, but you said that um, the actual fixant loves grabbing onto itself and grabbing onto lots of different fire molecules. How do you prevent it from just clotting up? Is it, it, um, or do you need to? It's a solution, it will clot up. You can actually make plastics out of glutaraldehyde or plastic-like things that are uh, very, very hard. Um, they almost feel like porcelain if you, if you allow it to fully cross-link. Uh, but the solution that we're using is 3% glutaraldehyde, and so it doesn't quite have enough to really polymerize into anything macroscopic. Um, it, it is gonna be making little chains, uh, but it's not gonna make anything that would be big enough to, to block a blood vessel. 
at least not at the time scales that we're dealing with here. Do you have to worry about the brain dying while you're putting in the initial solution? Um, the animal's alive uh, while the surgery is being done, uh, and then the washout solution is actually still compatible with the life of the animal and is cooling the brain down uh, as it's being perfused. And so up to that point, if you really um, if you really had to, right, and you had a surgical team that was prepared for it, you could actually reverse all of this, right? If even after you drain the blood out of the brain with a washout solution, you could put the blood back, and you could you'd have to repair all the surgical modifications you've made, but you could theoretically have that animal survive. And so the animal is alive exactly up to the point where the glutaraldehyde is introduced. Mm -hmm. There's different um, classes of cryoprotectants, and what's normally used in cryobiology are what's so-called unstable glasses. Um, so these are cryoprotectants that don't have an, the cryoprotectant solutions that don't have enough cryoprotectant to really properly uh, avoid ice crystal formation. If you cool them very quickly, there won't be any ice crystals, um, but the solution kind of does it reluctantly. It makes tiny little seed crystals everywhere that you can't see. And then when you warm that solution back up, paradoxically, the, the crystals grow while it's being warmed up. Um, but if you have 65% ethylene glycol, then it's intrinsically stable. It's thermodynamically stable so that it can't form ice. Even if you put a seed template ice crystal in, it would just destroy the, the seed crystal. And so uh, the other advantage is we can go and use more cryoprotectant than is generally possible uh, and actually get all the way to a stable glass forming agent. And then it doesn't matter how slowly you cool, and it doesn't matter how slowly you warm up. Uh, in practice, what I do for these brains is to cool them down. I just put them in a liquid nitrogen vapor storage system, and they will cool over the next hour or two. Um, and then to warm them up, we just put them on a countertop at room temperature and just wait for about 30 or 40 minutes or so. Uh, and there's no ice crystal formation, which is a good advantage, yes. Uh, while answering uh, his question, you mentioned that the animals are still alive. So does that mean you take an animal like a rat, you strap on some sort of uh, helmet or apparatus, and then you start the process of replacing the blood with the fluids, and then you are able to freeze the brain? Uh, you don't need a helmet so much as uh, just access to the carotid arteries in the neck, and, and it's, it's more like a kind of forked mechanism that, that goes in. You can actually see it. Eh, you can't quite see it in this picture, um, but but it's two kind of cannulas, and they're in, uh, and and that's all the attachment points that you need. Uh, very similar, you know, to like an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation machine, like they do for humans, right? You're going to attach them; they're going to help filter your blood, right? Except it's going directly through the carotids. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so to give a little bit of idea on the timeline, uh, Brain Preservation Foundation started in 2009. Uh, this research kind of started around 2014, um, and the prize was won early in uh, 2016. So it's, it's around two years. It really took more like about one year to uh, deal with all the problems uh, that occurred uh, to make this happen. And uh, so we won the Brain Preservation Prize uh, for preserving a rabbit brain. Uh, it was a pretty big occasion. Uh, the BBC came and did some, some good stuff. Uh, it, it appeared in a lot of publications. And uh, the way that we demonstrated that we'd preserved all the synapses in the rabbit brain was we preserved a rabbit brain. Uh, we sliced many different slices from it, uh, like you saw in the, the plastic. And uh, then we randomly picked a bunch of regions and looked to see if there were any disruptions in the synapses. Right? So, uh, you saw that there's always, you know, vesicles and a synaptic cleft. So if you were to see, for example, just a broken synapse where, you know, there's vesicles but there's kind of nothing it's attaching to, uh, even, like, one of those would disqualify uh, the brain. Uh, but everywhere we looked, um, including with the, the Fibson videos, uh, they all look fine, uh, which is generally accepted as, as good structural preservation. And this was independently judged by uh, Dr. Hayworth from the Brain Preservation Foundation. And uh, Sebastian Sung from uh, 
He was at Princeton, now he's at MIT. And here's some comparison images, all right? So this is a control brain. This is a brain that was just uh, fixed uh, with glutaraldehyde uh, in what's the standard way of preparing uh, brains for study and what's generally believed to uh, more or less approximate what this brain looks like in real life. Um, and then at a similar level of magnification, this is an ASC brain. And so uh, this is zoomed out a bit, all right? Um, but you know, here you can actually see individual neurons. So a little bit more uh, microanatomy here. This right here is a capillary. So this is where the uh, nutrients and the blood cells are going to go. Um, if you haven't prepared the brain all too well, you might sometimes see a red blood cell like in one of these capillaries. Um, <clears throat> these are the actual neuron cell bodies, all right? So this one uh, goes like this, like there, around, and that's one of them, all right? And then they've got these huge nuclei in them um, full of DNA. And this very dark material here is the actual DNA in that nucleus. Um, and so you can see there's not much of a difference between the two, uh, which is good. We did not want there to be much of a difference. And then if you were to zoom in, uh, this is, is zoomed in similarly to the original image that you're looking. Does this make any sense to people now, by the way? Yes. Hey, there we go. Yes? All right, we got synapses. So here's a synapse, um, and I'm, I'm able to tell that because there's vesicles here. The question was to point out the synapses. Um, so we've got one there, we've got one here, here, here. Mm, I don't know about that one. Maybe Fibsen would be better. That's a synapse. Um, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. You see the dark uh, lines are probably one of the best ways to find them. Yes? What shape are the vesicles? Are they spherical or are they long tubes? Uh, they're mostly spherical. Uh, there's actually some interesting uh, stuff there. Um, <clears throat> we have in this area of brain two different types of synapses, uh, one that's excitatory and one that's inhibitory. Um, the excitatory ones use glutamate in those little synaptic vesicles, and the uh, inhibitory ones have GABA amino butyric acid, or GABA, in them. And when the brain is alive, they're both spherical. But the process of aldehyde fixation actually causes, I believe, the, the GABA ones to become slightly ellipsoidal. So you can actually then differentiate them after the fixation process. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to address which parts of the brain there are, you're in, you're looking at, based on the proportion of neurotransmitters? You mean, um, you normally know where you are because you, you, it started from a whole brain. Right, so you would know where, where well, generally that was taken I'm from. Just, I'm just thinking in terms of if you're, if you're doing pharmacology, for example, um, the, the, if you were able to address, uh, say, send something in that would be able to only release in the region of the brain where you had a certain concentration, um, that would be feasible. Um, oh, you can, you can do a tremendous amount of... If you can paraphrase the question. Yeah, so, so the question, I, I think the question is, is it possible to like selectively label parts of this, uh, right? Like, could you say like label the excitatory synapses or something like that, right? Is is that the question? Well, I was more talking about statistically, like the uh, the proportion of neurotransmitters in a in a specific region of the brain. Is it pretty pretty well differentiated across the brain uh, so that you could uh, say, okay, if I have fifty one percent GABA and uh, that would say that I'm in a specific part of the brain um, that you could then, say, lice a vesicle and um, deliver a drug. I see. Okay, so you're wondering, uh, do different regions of the brain have different types of neurotransmitters that are around there? Um, and absolutely, there's different types of neurons. So where we are right now is the hippocampus, and the neurons that we've been looking at are uh, pyramidal cells in the hippocampus. And they're named that because they maybe kind of look like pyramids. Um, not really so sure about that, kind of, kind of a little bit maybe. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, yeah, so the pyramidal cells always use glutamate. Um, and so you can actually tell quite a bit, you know, knowing that this is in the hippocampus. Um, and if you had a 3D image, you could trace a synapse back to a thing that you recognize as a pyramidal cell. You suddenly know, oh, well, this vesicle has got glutamate in it. Um, 
And similarly, there's some inhibitory cells that, that exist around here, and they only use uh, GABA. And there's hundreds of different types of neurotransmitters, and uh, different subtypes of neurons use them. Normally, a neuron only makes one. Uh, some neurons make more than one. Uh, and so, yeah, depending on where you are, uh, it's kind of like Pokemon, right? You're going to have different, different little subtypes of neurons everywhere. Um, and they look quite different. You know, the, the cells in the motor cortex, for example, are very recognizable and very different than the cells in cortex or hippocampus. Um, or in the thalamus, you know, the thalamus is mostly these huge myelinated tracts that you don't see as much. Uh, one thing that I definitely didn't appreciate uh, until I actually started looking at real brains, um, you know, coming from a computer science perspective, is just how variable the brain is. Uh, I think, at least personally, I thought the brain was like a homogenous soup of computing stuff, right? Uh, but in fact, there's very distinct macroscopic structure. And you know, the genetics is such that it'll say, lay down a line of neurons here, and then lay down another different line of neurons right there, and lay one right there, and they're gonna be that type, and they're gonna be different. And it's reproducible in every single brain. And then you know, grow your projections up here, and grow your projections in this other one, and then the exact synapses they make, it depends on the experiences. But the overall topology of the brain is, is laid down genetically and it's very different. Um, it's actually very beautiful, the, the architecture. I would encourage you all to take a look at uh, maybe human coronal sections in the series because it's, uh, it's definitely something that I think is, is quite beautiful to look at. Um, so this is a control and you can make out synapses, all right? Again, synapse, synapse, synapse. And then this is ASC, all right? So this one, in addition to being fixed, was vitrified and then rewarmed. Um, and the important part here is the vitrification would allow it to be preserved for hundreds or thousands of years, whereas just the fixation uh, wouldn't enable you know, 100 years of storage. The Brain Preservation Prize, you had to be able to argue that it would work for at least 100 years. Um, and so who can find a synapse on this one for me? Come on, be brave. How about you? What do you think? Can you find one? You think so? All right. So, like you said, these are the vesicles. The dark parallel lines are usually where you'll find them, right? Yep. So that's all the synapses. Perfect. Good job. Let's hear it for her. <laughs> this is great. This is great. You guys, you guys, uh, you guys know how to read this stuff already. <laughs> um, so having succeeded on the rabbits, uh, we did this on pigs. So we built a larger machine. Um, and it actually, because these solutions are delivered by a perfusion, um, the only design criteria to scale it up to a larger animal is to use more solution and bigger pumps so that they can deliver the pressure needed. Um, it took seven months to design the machines and get everything working for the rabbit, but it only took one evening to design the machines for the pig. And then this is what we got from an ASC pig brain. Um, and this also is very promising. So uh, the pig brain is still currently being evaluated by the BPF. Um, but we're going to be hearing some good news from them, I think, uh, in the next month or two. Um, anyways, this is zoomed in a lot on the pig brain. I think I like this one a lot because you've got like six different synapses coming in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different synapses coming onto one neuron. And I think that's just pretty, pretty sweet. Um, it's very difficult to tell what species you're in at this level, uh, whether it's a human brain or a pig brain or a rabbit brain. One of the most striking differences, believe it or not, is the mitochondria look different uh, depending on what species you're in, but the synapses are a little bit more challenging. Um, yeah? Do you have an example of, at the same magnification of just being vitrified and without having been fixed? Uh, I do. Um, I can bring that up, I guess. Hold on one second. Oh, do we not have internet? Come on, give me internet. There we go. Uh, okay. So this uh, is equivalent to this about that that's about the same magnification 
So this is what it looks like without the, without the fixative. Is, uh, you see the, the profound dehydration effect that's caused um, by, by having to introduce cryoprotectin rapidly. So and the be there? You, you can't see them. I, I've never been able to see them. Um, now we can zoom in. Uh, so let's see, zoom in here, we'll find something. Uh, yeah, sure, we'll do this one. This one's, this one's about the highest mag one that's on here. Okay, so this is a roughly equivalent in magnification to, uh, to this. Because, so you can see like, um, here, let, me find a, let me find a good one for you. Okay, so like you see, you know, like maybe this process here, okay? Um, that, that would be equivalent to, to like this process here which is dehydrated and then pulled away, retracted from the surrounding uh, myelin. Um, and you know, you should be able to see, you know, probably a good 20 synapses in this image. Um, my best guess is that maybe this is a synapse, but, but maybe not. We're not bringing it back to life. We are uh, preserving the structure. So you start with a fixed brain. Um, you can remove the cryoprotectant. You can even rewarm an entire head with the cannula still attached and use perfusion to remove the cryoprotectant. Um, and then what you're left with after you've removed the cryoprotectant is a fixed brain. Um, there's no way to undo that gelling formation that, that the glutaraldehyde does. Um, I think an analogy would be, you know, let's say you had a book, right? And it's a very precious book. It's got a very important story written on it. Maybe you don't quite understand the language the story is written in, um, but, but it's very precious nonetheless. Uh, what ASC does is kind of the equivalent of mixing up a clear epoxy resin and pouring it on the book. And so it's going to glue the pages together. It's going to glue the ink to the pages. It's going to turn the whole book into a solid block of plastic, right? Um, and you're never going to open the book again. Uh, without some very extreme, crazy, crazy stuff. But uh, the information in that book is still there. As long as that epoxy doesn't cause the ink to run, um, that story still exists in that book. How could you get the story back? Uh, maybe you slice the book into slices and scan the pages and print and bind a new book. Maybe use an x-ray, and that x-ray is going to let you see into the book without having to even cut it up. Uh, but if you're, if you're very motivated, uh, you can get uh, the story back, and you can read that again, and you can have a new book. Um, and even if you insisted on unepoxying the book, uh, I would say that it's that it's certainly easier to figure out the chemistry to dissolve just the epoxy from the pages uh, than it would be to repair a hole in that book. You can imagine with you know billions of dollars of funding or something that you could figure out how to unepoxy a page, right? Um, but I don't know, you know, if there's actually a hole in that page, right? And there's actually a lacuna where you've lost a whole paragraph of text. It doesn't matter how much technology you have, you may never be able to uh, infer what that text was in that book. Uh, so, th so that's the difference, I think. Um, and th one of the interesting things, and, and I think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the world of brain preservation, is, is this was, you know, announced like 30 years ago, all right? Um, in 1986, uh, this guy, Drexler, described glutaraldehyde and, uh, and ethylene glycol to preserve brains and that that might be good to preserve structure. And it was never followed up on, on until I did it. And I didn't even know about this until after I'd been one way towards doing it. But yeah, it's, it's 30 years old as an idea. Um, I asked Drexler, you know, why didn't you do this? Um, and he said, well, I didn't have the lab, I didn't have the funding. I was interested in other things. So very fascinating. Um, so. I started this company, Nectome, uh, and the goal of Nectome is to continue this work. Um, we acquired a uh, STTR grant um, from National Institute of Mental Health to work on connectomics technologies um, in collaboration with uh, Boyden's lab at MIT. And the goal of this is to uh, design methods to take brains that have been preserved with ASC and then prepare them for whole brain nanoscale imaging. Uh, whole brain perfusion embedding and whole brain perfusion expansion. 
uh, which are some very cool technologies. Uh, this is a picture of our lab, and uh, we have a, a lab down in San Jose. And uh, we've, been, we've been doing good work on, on whole brain embedding and whole brain expansion. And then recently, we've started a uh, very interesting new project, uh, which I'm uh, pleased to announce to you guys uh, tonight, uh, which is to scale ASC to a human brain. Um, so this is our setup, and uh, we'll be receiving donated uh, human brains. We're working very closely um, with uh, third-party organizations so that we can obtain tissue samples uh, extremely rapidly post-mortem, uh, potentially uh, 15 minutes uh, to 30 minutes post-mortem. Uh, and we will see if, uh, if that's adequate for preserving the connectome. Uh, but in any case, this is going to be a major uh, advance uh, compared to normal brain banking technology, uh, which normally gets individuals 6 to 20 hours after death uh, and uses immersion fixation in formaldehyde uh, to do the preservation process. So we're very excited about this uh, new nanoscale human brain banking project that we're, that we're embarking on. The pig brain that you saw earlier um, was actually 20 minutes post-mortem um, and, and still looks quite good. So uh, we will see. We're doing our first uh, trial experiments this weekend. Uh, so it's going to be good. Yes? Maybe this is kind of switching gears a little bit, but it seems like the key assumption of your whole project is that all thought can be reduced to computation. A number of philosophers take a view where not all thought is computation, that there are non-computational processes at work in the brain. Like Kurt Gödel famously argued that uh, understanding mathematics was a non-computational process. David Chalmers would describe our inner felt experience, our subjective point of view, as something that's not computational. How, how, how do you respond to those philosophers? Well, you know, um, I give you a couple of intuition pumps at least, right? Uh, I wouldn't be too quick to say that just because it's intuitive to you that that therefore elevates your intuition to a universal truth uh, and a universal principle. Most people think that they're that the concept of a self is a thing, uh, that you're kind of one entity, um, but in reality it's more like you're the CEO of a gigantic corporation and the CEO doesn't necessarily even know what all the sub-departments are. Um, that's one of the first things you learn in neuroscience is that, that the self is not nearly a coherent and clean concept as you might imagine. Um, the case of split brain patients, for example. Uh, I mean, everybody's basically two separate people kind of stapled together, and you gotta pilot this body and, and make it happen. Uh, and you sort of don't realize that. Um, the things that I'm talking to right now that control your, your language, right, are, are kind of like responsible for telling stories about yourself, saying, oh, well, we did this you know, because we were angry, right? It's like a CEO making a mission statement for a company. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do this in the future. But in reality, you're this vast, incredibly complicated uh, computational system that has depths that, that aren't even aware, really, to your conscious mind, right? So the same way that the self becomes very slippery and maybe not a complete description of, of what you are, um, this idea of saying, well, it feels like you've got this first-person experience and it feels like there's something there, um, and therefore that is the fundamental organizing principle of the universe, uh, I would caution against uh, saying that that's true, right? It's very easy to assume that, that you have this privileged view of yourself, but you don't. Um, you are a tiny the part of you that, that really is, is telling these stories about yourself is like a tiny part of a vast organization. Um, and it can feel sometimes, you know, like the leader of the company is the company, but at best that's an abstraction. And I'm not saying abstractions aren't useful. Uh, it, it can be very useful to say uh, that there's a sense of self and that, of course, you know, there's a you that's perceiving things, right? Um, the same way that saying that there's an object is useful, right? Uh, but objects are a thing that we project onto the world. Right? They're not a, you can't take a thing and say, where is the objectness of this thing? Right? How do I measure it? Because uh, what you might say is like a pen with a cap on it is one object. I might say, well, that's two objects. Right? There's a cap and a pen. If you open it apart, is it you know, two separate objects now? And if you put it together, is it the same object as it was before? Um, you can do whatever bookkeeping you want. You can say it's a different thing now than it was before. You took it into two parts and then the two parts came together to make a new object. 
you can say it's the same one before. Uh, what you can't really argue about is if you drop it, will it fall, right? That's the thing you can, can really talk about empirically. Um, but really, I, I don't tend to try to criticize people for their own internal bookkeeping, although I do think it's a category error to then say, well, your bookkeeping is like a real thing that exists in the world. It's a real thing that computationally exists in your mind, of course. It physically exists. It's a thing that your brain does, uh, but, it, but it doesn't exist in the, in the thing. Same error of saying, like, you know, where is the center of mass of an object, right? Like, can you find the atom that is the center of mass? Like, that's, that's a nonsense question to ask. So, given that the world is computable, that physics is computable, all right, then your brain, being a part of the physical world, is also computable. Um, and the only way out of saying that, uh, therefore, the brain is a computational thing is to say that the brain is not a physical thing or not entirely a physical thing. Um, and you can bite that bullet, but then why? Like, what do you need to explain um, about the brain or about human behavior that can't be explained by neuroscience? That can't be explained by looking at the machinery and seeing, okay, this, uh, these neurons work in this way and it leads to this behavior. There's a lot of evidence that would have convinced me that we had things like souls, okay? If you opened up a human head and there's like one atom of cobalt in there surrounded by a bunch of salt water, and yet we still did all of our uh, behaviors, I think that would begin to necessitate some sort of very um, metaphysical explanation for how we do this. But when you open up a human head, you see a quadrillion synapses, and there's these machines constantly working, and they change their size whenever you learn a thing. And if you go in and like invoke the machinery to reduce the size of the synapses that just increased, it perfectly erases that memory. And when you like create false memories with optogenetics, it works, right? And it's all based on synapses. So there seems to be plenty of machinery in the brain that you don't need any more explanation beyond the incredible like huge machine that, that seems to be doing all this. Yeah. Um, um, kind of on I think all the work you're doing is awesome, uh, and especially like the analogy to the 6502 project. Um, but um, in that vein, if we wanted to reconstruct the brain, you know, slice it up into bits and computationally simulate it, um, what other information outside of the actual synaptic connections of the brain would you need to know if you wanted to do that reconstruction? And then how do we get that extra information? All right, so the question is, you know, okay, you really want to do uh, a brain scan and you want to get an accurate simulation. What sort of stuff do you need um, other than maybe these electron micrographs, right? Is the video enough or is there more that you need? Um, and this is still uh, being debated. Um, I'll, I'll say a couple of comments on it, I guess. Um, it's really interesting that if I know the geometry of the whole neuron, right, I can then say, well, this is a pyramidal cortical neuron, so therefore the chemical that exists in these vesicles must be glutamate, right? Um, and that's information that exists in the electron micrographs, even though if you only saw a picture of a vesicle, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it had GABA or glutamate in it. And so um, it may very well be that you can kind of work out most of this stuff um, from electron micrographs. Uh, there's this question, you, you certainly need a lot of electrophysiological data, right? You need to know how do these neurons actually work. This is one of the main things that is blocking us from getting C. elegans to work. Uh, so, uh, people say, well, we scanned the connectome of C. elegans in the 80s, so why can't we simulate it? And the reason is we don't actually know for most of the synapses in C. elegans whether they're even excitatory or inhibitory. We don't even know the sign of them. Um, and it's not like it's impossible to determine that, but it, you would need a very systematic uh, study of each of those neurons and how they actually behave in order to figure out what the, the characteristics of that neuron is. Um, or another analogy might be, you know, if I gave you a circuit diagram of a thing, but I failed to label you know, which ones are the resistors and which ones are the capacitors, uh, you're gonna have a very hard time simulating that circuit. You either can't do it or you have to search in a thing that's exponential in the number of components to actually make it work. Uh, and then there may be things that are fundamentally ambiguous. Okay, So some things like gap junctions, for example, where, or so-called electrical synapses, where they're not like your normal synapse, they're just two membranes that are against each other and they have a bunch of little um, proteins called connections between them that just blow holes through them. They create these like channels. And so the neuron can directly share proteins and of course ions uh, with each other. So if that neuron's firing, then that electrical synapse is even a more intimate connection than a chemical synapse. 
And those can be challenging to see with an electron micrograph uh, to the point where sometimes under certain preparations they're just totally invisible, right? And I do think you probably have some trouble uh, simulating your brain accurately if you didn't have the, where the electrical synapses were. Some people argue against that. Some people say those are mostly there. Uh, they're much more common between inhibitory neurons. And so it's thought that maybe that the inhibitory neurons themselves uh, just simply function to kind of dial back the um, excitability of the network. The brain's kind of always on the edge between epilepsy and coma. And it's got to be right on the edge of, of a sort of criticality so that even a small cluster of neurons can cause macroscopic behavior, right? And it's able to amplify microscopic to, to macroscopic. And so you've got these excitatory synapses, and then you've got just a mesh of inhibitory synapses. And maybe it doesn't matter as much uh, where the inhibitory connections are, exactly what their characteristics are, just that it's generally dialing the whole system down and the information stored in the excitatory synapses. In that case, it may be sufficient to simply um, know where the excitatory synapses are. And then you just say, and the whole system is dialed back a little bit. Um, now let's say there's a neuron that's got two different types of neurotransmitters um, and that you can't be disambiguated um, with electron microscopy, all right? So then that would potentially pose a really big challenge um, if an electron micrograph was being used to simulate the brain tissue up to maybe making it impossible. Um, what you would do in that case is you could label the individual uh, proteins that matter uh, with any of a number of immuno labels or other techniques uh, to actually bind to these and, and differentially stain them. You may find that a different heavy metal stain causes a differential staining. So uh, you can expose the brain to whatever preparation techniques that you need to highlight these different um, things that are judged to matter. Uh, and then when you start getting into, well, what if there's like a thousand different things that you have to disambiguate, you may be getting into some limits of, um, of the current staining protocols to, to, to disambiguate it. Um, so there's certainly a lot of debate as to whether electron micrographs of the kind we can get now would be sufficient. Um, but then going a step back and saying, well, is ASC itself uh, insufficient in that regard um, is a little bit trickier because those proteins are still there. If you need a particular ion channel, um, that's going to be glued into that membrane and glued to the other ion channels with the glutaraldehyde, right? Uh, and there may be challenges associated with labeling that in a way that's consistent with labeling all the other things you still need to label. Um, but it's like those proteins are still fundamentally there, so the information is still there. Um, what would really sync uh, ASC is if there was a, a memory storage mechanism in the brain that's simultaneously so fragile it gets destroyed by very rapid glutaraldehyde fixation, but also so robust that it survives a lot of other things that we know we can do to brains that don't erase long-term memory, such as cooling them down to 10 degrees Celsius or exposing them to five minutes of ischemic injury. Um, and it's hard to point to anything in the brain that, that has both of those properties. Yeah. Uh, so do you think that there's like, much information that could ever really be extracted from a brain on through vitrification without fixation? Uh, like, do you think we would ever get to a point where we could try to like, model that uh, dehydration and the malformation of those structures uh, to try to rebuild what it initially looked like so that we could map it? Or do you think it's kind of a lost cause, especially if the brain, you know, it took like 18 hours? Uh, well, so this is, this is like, I, this, this is a brain that, that was preserved under like, a euthanasia style condition. I, I believe this is from a dog brain. Um, if you actually let a brain go for 18 hours and it looks like this, uh, give, give me a moment, I can bring it up. It's, it's not pretty. Um, let me see here. I'm sure I can find this. If you, if you, give, me, if you give me a minute, I can find one that, that was left out for you know, uh, much greater than, than 20 or so hours. But do you um, think that there's still like, much value to be, like do you think that it's a, kind of a reasonable goal to try to be able to map that in the future? Um, or do you think that without ASC, it's not really possible to think about rebuilding that structure in the future? Like, is that still, is this, you know, on the screen still a viable map that could one day be translated back into an accurate visual, visualization? Well, let me, uh, 
let me show let me show you what brains look like after like 20 minutes or after about 20 hours or so. Um, Oh, oops. <laughs> uh, they're basically gone, all right? Like, there, there's, there's basically literally nothing left. Um, you, you just see cytoplasm everywhere and a bunch of, like, trash kind of littered around, and there's no synapses, and it's, like, 20 times worse than even this. Um, but it's very hard to disprove a negative, right? So to say the information's gone, right, like, what does that mean? If I take a book and, I, and my preservation method for that book is to just incinerate the book, and there's the ashes, right? Uh, is the information gone, right? Well, you might think that, uh, that it would be gone, but maybe a sufficiently advanced, you know, cryptographic approach to extracting the information could get it. Um, even if you destroy synapses, does that really mean the memories are gone? Well, neurons have got genetic tags in them so that they can avoid synapsing onto themselves. Because again, if a neuron becomes too excited, then it can destroy itself, right? So they really don't want those feedback loops. So a neuron can tell when it's synapsing onto a, a tree somewhere whether that's self or not. Uh, so you know maybe that provides extra information. Um, I guess the less you can rely on unspecified, extremely advanced search processes in the future to disambiguate the information, the better, right? So we know that synapses are important for memory storage. So every bit of damage that's done to the to the, to the connectome is going to certainly make it less likely. Um, to be able to recover a brain. And I think you can make it um, quantitative. Uh, I think you can say, uh, let's say you take 10 mice, all right? And you're gonna, op you're gonna label the engrams in those mice that represent two different places, okay? You can, you can do this in, in the literature currently. Um, and so those are gonna make projections into the amygdala. You know, if you looked at a slice of the amygdala, you'd see some red neurons, you'd see some green neurons coming in, right? Um, and let's say you then induce a fear memory in five of those 10 mice of place A, and five of the other 10 mice of place B, okay? And then you preserve all of those brains with whatever preservation method you want to test, okay? And then the name of the game is you have 10 brains. You have to sort them into two groups. You can use whatever technique you want. Um, and those two groups then need to correspond to the two training groups, right? So this is almost like a zero knowledge way of, of telling whether, whether the information that defines an answer to this high level question, were they afraid of place A or B, uh, was still there, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to, to differentiate them. And it doesn't matter what you use. Maybe you have some crazy machine learning thing that tries to separate them, right? Uh, but if you then, with one preservation technique, can always get it perfect, right? You always separate them. And with another preservation technique, you do better than chance, but you don't always get it right. Then you can say, well, the one technique's better than the other technique. And maybe a new method would allow the, you'd always perfectly differentiate it. Um, and so then you can say, well, they're better under this method of, of data extraction. Um, so, so I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity to make these, these things more rigorous, to say this preservation technique is good under these conditions, right? Um, but do you think brains that have already been preserved still have like a reasonable chance of being mapped and like being singular? Even if, um, even if the brain is, there, there's also this interesting idea of, of signal noise ratio, right? Uh, as you start to get towards this limit of is it actually infer are the structures inferable or not, you end up having to invest tremendous amounts of computation to, to disambiguate it, right? Um, and then at a certain point, maybe it's theoretically possible to, to figure out a whole connectome of 86 billion neurons and, uh, and a quadrillion synapses, but the amount of computation that we would be required to, to fix every little bit is, is crazy, right? Especially if the only way to, to prove whether it worked or not is to try to simulate the whole thing, right? Then you have number of simulations that begins to grow exponentially in the number of synapses that you're trying to, to correct, right? Um, so, you know, even in a perfectly preserved brain, right, we still got our work cut out for us to scan a whole liter of material at two nanometer resolution and, and even just tracing that, even with ideal staining, is going to be very challenging. Is it impossible? Like, eh, I don't know. But um, I definitely think that we ought to be putting a lot of resources into proving that memory is preserved. We were able to prove that all the synapses were preserved in a brain, and we didn't have to scan a whole brain. What we did was we spot checked a bunch of different points. We looked, and everywhere we looked, the synapses still looked very good. And so that 
gets a very satisfactory amount of proof that all the synapses have got to be good because we would have found them if, if, uh, if there were any that were really bad. Um, or put another way, the incidence of damaged synapses has got to be you know, extremely low in these ASC preserved brains. I think you can do a similar thing for memory. Uh, it looks like some of these zero knowledge proofs. You know, that one is dealing with memories that are encoded in the amygdala, right? You could deal with memories that are encoded in different uh, brain regions, right? You could start to say, well, we'll put 100 bits into this mouse and we'll extract them out again. Um, so so those, those are some of the things I think about. I dread having to, you know, go through a FibSim stack of these where I can't even find a synapse in, in a single image and then get a perfect uh, connectome. You saw how complicated the, that video of, of all these things against each other was. Uh, it seems very challenging. Hey, Robert. And at this point? Yeah, we've got about like Five. 10 minutes. I'll give it 10. So I want you to have as much time as you want to go through any more slides you want to go through, but I just want to give you a heads up. You know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the questions. I got some cool slides that show um, some of the process a little bit more, which I, I really enjoy. Um, you know, here's some picture of some, some brains that are preserved in plastic. Um, you know, this is a picture of some of the recent work we've been doing at Nectome where we use perfusion to actually uh, do the entire process of embedding. Uh, so not only are we putting in cryoprotectants, but we're putting in like heavy metal stains like uranium acetate, osmium tetroxide. Uh, we're putting in ethanol, we're putting in plastic resins. And this is a, a picture from a very late stage where the brain has been put into into resin and it's been blackened because of the osmium tetroxide. Um, you know, here's an example of a whole brain that's been turned into, into plastic from these techniques, which I think is pretty cool. Um, kind of close up. Uh, you know, these are some of the rabbit and pig brains that we did. Uh, I, I just find these fascinating. This is a vial of osmium tetroxide, which is nasty stuff. Uh, but, but yeah, whatever, whatever questions you have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the question is kind of, you know, what do we really understand about the brain? What do we not with regards to simulating a brain, um, right? Yeah. Great. Uh, so I think I'll send to the group uh, some stuff by uh, Dr. Hayworth that, that gets into a bunch of, of references. Um, but it's amazing in the literature how much people say, yeah, it's basically synapses. Um, I think a couple good ways to think about it is, you know, if you do understand a system, then you ought to be able to manipulate that system. And so. Um, there's some very impressive uh, work that's come out in the last few years uh, involving erasing memories and creating false memories by manipulating uh, synaptic structures. And if there was too much more complexity beyond that, uh, you, we shouldn't be able to selectively knock out one single motor memory and leave another motor memory that's almost identical to it, like perfectly intact. Um, that seems somewhat implausible. So I mean, do I think there's going to be some gotchas and some interesting surprises? Like, absolutely. Um, do I think the whole like dogma of synaptic basis of memory is just completely wrong and it's something, you know, we're not even at the right level yet? Um, I don't think that's true. Um, uh, but in any case, I'll, I'll send out some resources. Hey, Robert. Yeah. Can you talk for a second about where you see culturally and socially this going? Because I think you have an interesting viewpoint on this. Like, uh, when we talked, you talked about sort of brain banks and cultural preservation of memory. Well, one thing that really excites me is this issue of justice, okay? What, is, what does a just world, like, look like? Um, you know, have any, what, anybody ever read Martha Nussbaum by any chance? Okay, great. So we're talking about, uh, you know, sort of what is the path of humanity? We take this world that doesn't really care about us. Uh, we replace what's natural with what's just. And, you know, we decide what justice is. Um, but I think that's a beautiful thing that, you know, we got dealt a kind of bad hand uh, with nature. Nothing really cared about us very much. Um, but we were able to, we care about each other, and so we can change the world through technology, and the world can begin to care about us like we care about each other. And I think that, you know, to the extent that we care about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, 
as fundamental human rights. Uh, life's number one, and most people who die don't want to die. Um, and even the people who are on the fence about dying or not, they're on the fence because it's been preceded by a lot of suffering as their body falls apart. Um, I do think that if it could be demonstrated to preserve memories, a program of brain preservation and uh, eventual digitization uh, would be a great benefit for humanity, uh, both at an individual level and at a, at a societal level. Uh, every generation, we get more powerful technology, but I don't think we get better wisdom because wisdom is something you need to spend a lifetime developing for yourself. And unfortunately, you can't really communicate wisdom to another person with language. Language isn't powerful enough to do it. The synapses would be, I mean, the actual computation in your mind is, but there's no good way to serialize it. There's no way to convey to someone what it really feels like to be in another place. The best I can do is tell you stories about it. Um, it does a good job, but I think especially as we become more powerful, we've, we've got to get a solution for having our wisdom increase as our technological power increases. And I could see digitization of memories uh, to be one of those potential technologies that would enable that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this relates more to. Uh, yeah, this relates more to the philosophical discussion earlier. But um, do you believe? Does this project rely on the assumption that humans have no free will? Well, humans got to have free will. Humans have consciousness. Humans have free will. Like. Everything sums back up to normality in the end. So if you read something about some arcane branch of physics and you suddenly think like, everything's a lie, love isn't real, like nothing matters, like <laughs> just, just stop and rethink your life a little bit. Um, just because something's bookkeeping in your head doesn't make it not real, right? Objects are real. Uh, they're not real in the same way that, that just a strictly material thing would be real, but they're incredibly useful constructs that you need to navigate the world. And free will, uh, if it's going to be sensibly defined at all, means your ca capability of making choices, right? Uh, and you certainly contain algorithms that are able to evaluate situations and make choices. So uh, to say that that's not true is, is crazy. Um, now, if free will is saying there's some metaphysical thing that, that exists that isn't material, um, that's kind of a weird thing to be talking about. Um, but I think the common use of the idea of free will, that you know, are you capable of making choices based on information that you receive uh, that's relevant to your personality, yeah, obviously everybody does that. We're going to pause there. All right. All right. <laughs> Salute you all. Thanks for talking to you.